Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the top 10 new PC games to play. This one for the month of October 2021. We're really getting into the thick of things now. Uh, the next couple of months are going to be very busy when it comes to new games to check out. I mean, even now there's a lot going on. Last week we got Kenya and Diablo 2. This week we had the launch of Lemnis Gate, which is neat. And the big one everyone's talking about, of course, New World, which I know personally will be keeping me busy for a while. Once I'm done with that though, it does look like there's plenty of other games on the horizon to look forward to in October. Uh, we've got a few indie titles that seem really, really neat, like this survival RTS, a narrative-driven horror game, the sequel to Darkest Dungeon. There's also a couple of new MMOs being released. Well, there's one new MMO technically. The other one is a tiny MO. I'll explain that later. Uh, the RTS genre might be making a comeback with this latest installment of a classic. And then beyond that, October is also the start of the AAA blockbuster holiday release season. What that means is we're going to be getting some massive, highly anticipated, big budget games coming as well. There's a lot to cover here, some really, really great looking games, and we'll get into that right after a word from today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored once again by the immersive sci-fi space MMO EVE Online. This is the same game you often hear about due to its massive large-scale PvE and PvP battles. In fact, they have quite literally set a few Guinness World Records with the scale of these things. It's kind of insane, actually. But beyond that, the big battles, EVE offers plenty of other things for you to do. You can explore its thousands of star systems, engage in the game's various politics, piracy, and of course trading, as it does feature a player-driven economy. If you've ever been interested, now is one of the best times to jump into the game. EVE's most recent quadrant update called Gateway brought with it an overhaul new player experience, introduced improvements to the skill system, along with skill plans, which are meant to help guide you through some of the important early game decisions to make sure you don't make any big mistakes. Jumping into EVE for the first time right now will take you through a brand new story-driven training experience. This is much more immersive and detailed than anything they've had in the past, and is mainly aimed at just helping new players get their bearings in such a big game. So yeah, if you are interested in checking out EVE for yourself, you can register using the link link below in the video description. In fact, doing so will get you 1 million free skill points, which is about one month's worth of training time, which in turn means that you can jump into the later game action quicker. Okay, so let's go ahead and just jump right in. Kicking things off, the game is Age of Darkness Final Stand. This is a dark fantasy survival RTS where you must illuminate, build, and defend humanity's last bastion against hordes of enemies. During the daytime, you'll gather resources fortify defenses and recruit new allies in preparation for the night, at which point nightmare creatures will start pouring in, relentlessly attacking your home base. The goal is simple, you must survive the night and try to live to fight another day. So you'll navigate the game, it's got a procedurally generated map, and you'll use these light sources to push back what they're calling this dynamic death fog that conceals enemies, but also damages your troops if they walk through it. You'll have to try to clear your way through this and then claim back territory while also hunting for resources. Resources. You'll then use those resources to build defenses back at your home base. Uh, the game will run on a day-night cycle that transitions with time. So basically, you're just fighting the clock in preparation for nightfall. And then once night comes, the attack begins. These enemies, which are called nightmares, there's a wide assortment of them that'll just start pouring in. They're the basic swarmers, but also special units like the spitters, the crushers, and the race, each of which will require their own unique strategies to fight. And you'll face what they call overwhelming numbers of enemies, they're leveraging this internally developed technology, which they refer to as swarm tech. Apparently, get this, they say that the game can render over 70,000 enemy units on screen at one time. You heard me correctly, 70,000. Now, I don't think I see 70,000 in any of this footage, but it's certainly a large number, and either way, it's pretty impressive. Um, the game will feature these rogue light mechanics with these malices and blessings. Malices are random afflictions placed on the player. However, if you survive the night, you'll get to choose from one of three randomly selected blessings, which will make you stronger. There's also this champion system. You'll be able to micromanage these powerful, unique heroes with special abilities that can help you turn the tide of battle. These will level up, getting stronger, and then letting you select from their very own skill trees. To go along with that, though, the enemy also has their own elite roaming champions, and you can fight these to gain special resources. All in all, this is a pretty neat-sounding game, and I do think it looks decent as 
well. Now it's worth noting here though that the developer is a company by the name of Playside and they have mostly made mobile games from everything that I could see. I could not find any other PC titles that they have developed. This appears to be their first attempt, attempt on the platform. Now that said, for a first attempt, this does look pretty good. Age of Darkness Final Stand is coming to the PC via Steam's early access on October 7th. As of now, I could not find a price. The next game on our list is Far Cry 6, which appears to be delivering the standard tried and true Far Cry formula in a brand new setting with a, a few new bells and whistles. So our virtual sandbox of this go around is called Yara. It's a tropical paradise that they say is frozen in time, run by a dictator looking to restore his nation to its former glory. We play as a guerrilla fighter leading the revolution against this regime. So we have our villain, we have our hero. Now it's time for more Far Cry. We'll be doing all the typical Ubisoft open world things. Got a fairly large play space to roam around and explore. I will say from what I've seen, Yara as a location looks pretty gorgeous, made up of these numerous tropical islands. That's gonna have plenty of unique spots and points of interest to discover like most Far Cry games do. Hell, like most Ubisoft open world games do. For all of their faults, they make big worlds to explore with lots of different locations to see, right? So the world is going to be broken up into these various regions, which we'll have to work to gain the trust of and help liberate them from the regime. Uh, and this process will, of course, send us on all sorts of side missions, doing various tasks. And then, of course, there are going to be bases to clear. It will not be a Far Cry game without clearing bases. So we'll have to scout and take on these various enemy encampments. We'll get to choose from a wide variety of different tools and weapons at our disposal. You know, some people like to go in loud, guns blazing, throwing grenades, tripping alarms. Me, I usually am all about stealth in these games. I like to tag every single enemy in a compound before I move in and then take them down one at a time. It's going to be a pretty interesting arsenal of unique weapons here as well, all kind of cobbled together by our guerrilla allies. And there's also an assortment of vehicles to ride, as you expect, like cars, bikes, helicopters, even tanks and horses. And we'll make use of animal companions that fight by our side, including this wiener dog, alligator gator and a rooster. And then finally, the big point that I saw for this game is that it's going to feature this fairly large sprawling capital city, which apparently is a new thing for a Far Cry game. Um, Esperanza, they say it's called. So Far Cry 6 is coming to consoles, PC and Stadia on October 7th for $59.99. And I mean, as far as a Far Cry game goes, this looks pretty interesting. If I have the time, I think I'd like to give this one a look. Next on our list is Book of Travels. I've talked about this a few times in the past, but let me give you guys a recap. This is an atmospheric online RPG that takes place in this hand-drawn fairy tale inspired world. It's pulling from genre classics. They say this game lacks the restraints of linear missions and plot lines, instead giving players the liberty to travel the free wilds and vivid cities, stumble upon hidden places, and unravel mysteries on their own. There is no overarching goal. There's no one set in stone narrative. It's all about how you go across it, how you explore what you discover and enjoying the world for its own sake. Basically, they say they want players to experience an adventure that does not hold their hand. Now, they're also calling Book of Travels a TMORPG or Tiny Multiplayer Online RPG, where you will occasionally run into other real players who are also on their own adventure. And at that point, you can choose if you want to work with and play together or just continue on your adventures by yourself. Some of the game's major features include over 20 forms to choose from from, kind of like classes, but not really. So there's a detailed character creator that mainly focuses on personality and identity rather than stats or classes like traditional RPGs. You can choose to be a danger-seeking adventurer, a stoic practitioner of magic, or maybe you're a carefree tea-drinking gambler. The choice is yours. Clearly, this is going to be a game that's leaning heavy into the role-playing aspects of RPGs. Um, they say there's an evolving world and narrative as you encounter countless randomly occurring events making your story unique every session. They also say there are tons of intricate event chains to unlock items, character secrets, and hidden gameplay features depending on how you approach the game. And like I said earlier, you will periodically run into other players. While there is no in-game chat, the game does make use of these unique symbols that you'll learn and unlock as you play, and you can use this to communicate with others non-verbally. So this is coming to Steam Early Access on October 11th. Um, I didn't see a price when I last looked either. The game does have a really interesting, unique look. That said, I am keeping my expectations low. I mean, they are calling it tiny in terms of their own self-description. So I'm going to keep my bar of expectations set at 
this is going to be a tiny game, whatever that ends up meaning. Moving on, next up is Back for Blood, the four-player co-op first-person zombie shooter from Left 4 Dead creator Turtle Rock Studios. I played the beta for this earlier this year and overall had a decent time. There were some rough edges for sure, but ultimately it was fun taking down zombies with my friends. Uh, we get a look at a few co-op campaign missions, which were the highlight for me, and some of the PvP, which was not a highlight. I'll touch on why in a second. But yeah, this is a four-player co-op first-person zombie shooter. That's the basics. It's made up of those two primary modes, the co-op campaign, where you play through these handcrafted missions that each take place in unique locations with their own narrative, objective, progression, and encounters. So you'll start off in a staging area where you set up your equipment and load out from the weapons and, and items you have to what cards you pick, which are basically like passive bonuses. And then you start the mission moving through the level, fighting off the Ridden, which are the zombies, taking part in special events and battling bosses. Now you'll be able to replay these on various difficulty levels and there's a director AI system which dynamically makes things more challenging depending on how you play. And then there's the PvP. This is called Swarm. It's a four versus four cleaners versus ridden round base mode. Matches are in a best of three format with each team of four taking turns playing as the cleaners and the ridden. Now when I played the PvP, I just didn't think it was any fun, honestly. The biggest thing was there was just way too much downtime in between each round with the cleaners uh, getting a long time to do their scavenging process. And then when you actually got to play the game and fight the other team, the rounds were just way too short to add on top of this. All of the maps that we played were super tiny. I just didn't enjoy the PvP, but I did really like the co-op campaign and I could certainly see myself playing this game for a bit. Back for Blood is coming to the PC and consoles on October 12th for $59.99. Moving on, our next game this month is Elyon, an upcoming traditional Eastern styled MMORPG that looks to be delivering much of what you would expect from a theme park MMO. Uh, this is also a game that I played. They had a beta the other month and I came away from this game feeling like it was just okay. Not, It wasn't terrible, but it also didn't do anything that blew me away, at least when it comes to my first impressions. It's got a fairly linear leveling experience. You'll move from zone to zone following the main story and completing side quests from these NPCs that you found in each zone's small town. Leveling the game um, actually looks to be fairly quick. I think I got to level 30 in just one afternoon of playing the beta. The game does feature an action combat system similar to Terra. In fact, I don't have much Terra experience, but people say it's nearly identical. Basically, the style here is that you use these AoE and cleave attacks to take down big groups of enemies. And I thought combat was genuinely the strong suit from when I played it. It felt really good. It was responsive. There were nice animations and feedback. I can certainly see um, why people would enjoy this game just for the combat alone. Now outside of that, Elyon also ticks all of the typical standard content boxes. It's got dungeons, raids, there are world bosses, there's a housing system. In terms of PvP, there are arenas, battlegrounds, open world RVR. Like I said, it has most of what you expect out of a theme park MMO, including a cash shop. It sure as hell has one of those. Now, like I said, I played Elyon. I thought it was okay. I do think that their decision to the delay the game a few weeks was smart because originally it was supposed to come right after New World. Changing that was a good idea. New World has really taken off. It's super popular right now. But odds are by the time Elyon comes out in a few weeks, some people will be moving on, possibly me included. So Elyon is launching on the PC on October 20th. Now, originally the game had a base price of $29.99. However, they have changed that and decided to go free to play. I don't know what this means for their cash shop. They said it's not going to change. It wasn't really especially good in the first place. But hey, you know what? It's a new free to play MMO for people to check out. So if you're tired of New World by October 20th, you'll have something else to, to to give a look at least. Next up, we've got the Dark Pictures Anthology House of Ashes. Now, as the name implies, this is part of a series. There's the standalone cinematic branching horror games where the decisions you make determine the story and the outcome of the game. Now, this is the third installment of eight total games that are planned for this anthology. House of Ashes in particular takes place at the close of the Iraq War, where these special forces that were hunting for weapons of mass destructions unearth a buried Sumerian 
Sumerian temple containing unearthly creatures. They say here, in order to survive the night below, they must forge a brotherhood with their enemies from the world above. Ooh. <laughs> so it's a cinematic branching horror game that's all about the decisions you make in each moment. And again, these are severe decisions, life or death situations, quite literally. So you'll navigate this underworld and fight your way through the buried Sumerian temple against these hordes of deadly monsters. The game will feature the two critically acclaimed multiplayer modes from their prior games. You can either share the story online with a friend, or you can play offline with their five player past the pad mode. Now the first two games in this anthology were fairly well received. They've got pretty good Steam reviews last I looked. Personally, I haven't played either one of these. Um, I don't know how much like story driven horror games are really my thing, but this does look cool. It was absolutely worth a mention. So the Dark Pictures Anthology House of Ashes is coming to the PC and consoles on October 22nd for $29.99. Next up, we have got Darkest Dungeon 2. Yes, Darkest Dungeons sequel. Now the original was this challenging, gothic, roguelike turn-based RPG that was all about like the psychological stresses of adventuring. You would recruit, train, and lead a team of these flawed heroes against just like ridiculous monsters, these unimaginable horrors, stress, famine, disease, uh, this ever encroaching darkness, which you had to use uh, torches to combat. The original game was amazing. I, I loved it and I played quite Quite a bit of it. In fact, I think I've got a playthrough series on the channel. Some of the major features of this series was this affliction system. So not only are you fighting monsters, but also just stress. You'll contend with paranoia, masochism, fear, irrationality, and a host of uh, gameplay meaningful quirks. An innovative turn-based combat that pits you against a host of diabolical monsters. There's the narration system that celebrates your success and failures. The narrator was a huge part of that original game. Um, a bunch of different playable hero classes with their own unique strengths and weaknesses. It, it was just a really cool game. You should definitely check out the original if you haven't. Now, Darkest Dungeon 2 will just be expanding on that base game. They'll be adding new content areas, enemies, and features. At least I assume they will. I, I have seen zero specifics about the sequel. I looked on the game's official website. I looked on the store page where the game is being sold. I looked on all of the YouTube videos released for their, this game. I didn't see any specifics in terms of what's new and what they're adding. Normally, I try to provide a lot more depth when it comes to my discussion of these games every month. I had a really, really hard time finding specifics about Darkest Dungeon 2, but because I liked the original Darkest Dungeon so much, I'm just going to assume they're just like taking that game and making it better. So Darkest Dungeon 2 is coming to early access on PC on October 26th. I haven't seen a price yet. Uh, this one also is going to be an Epic Store exclusive. I know for some people that's a deal breaker, so I just wanted to let you know. All right, Moving on to the eighth game for this month, we have got Solar Ash. This is a stylish 3D platformer set in a large open world where we play as a void runner trying to save her homeworld. Now, this is the second game from Heart Machine, the studio that made Hyper Light Drifter, a very critically acclaimed indie title. And it's for that reason alone that I think there's some pretty high expectations for Solar Ash. So this game will be plunging us into a surreal, vivid, and highly stylized world filled with these wild, high speed, traversal, endearing characters, and massive enemy encounters. This game is all about movement. You can glide, jump, you have a grappling hook, all of this letting you quickly traverse and navigate this environment. They say that combat in the game is going to be simple, fast, and fluid, designed to encourage flowing from one action to the next. In fact, from the gameplay footage I saw, it looks like you're just never stopping moving. You're just doing combat as you're traversing the world. Uh, this game has an amazing look to it. I love the style. I love the character design design in the world. And like I said, because it's from the studio that made Hyperlight Drifter, I think expectations here are pretty darn high. Solar Ash is coming to the PC and PlayStation consoles on October 26. No price at the moment. And this one is also going to be an epic exclusive for now on PC. Next up, we've got Age of Empires 4. And boy, am I pumped for this one. I played the stress test the other week and had a blast. I made a full video talking about this. Uh, and like I've said in that video and others, Honestly, if you had told me that this was just like a updated version of Age of Empires or Age of Empires 2, I would have believed you. Playing this game felt like how I remember playing those games as a child. But regardless, I had a good time. Uh, it, it has the tried and true RTS experience, meaning you start off with one main base and some workers, and then you set them out harvesting resources. You scout for the enemy, gather more resources, start building up homes, military stuff, uh, get some upgrades, amass a huge army, and a attack your enemy. It is that kind of an RTS. It's also a big, big 
part of this is base building, setting up your walls, moving through the ages, all that stuff. Now, according to the game's Steam page, some of the notable features of Age of Empires 4 include familiar, but also innovative new ways to play. The game's gonna support 4K. There's gonna be eight civilizations with four campaigns and 35 missions to play through. They're gonna have mod support in early 2022. And there's of course multiplayer. You can compete, cooperate, or spectate with up to seven players in various modes. And evidently the game's gonna have a tutorial to teach the basics of RTS. And yeah, Age of Empires 4, I played it. I had a great time and I'm really looking forward to it. This will be launching on October 28th. And um, I don't know why I don't have a price listed here. I'm guessing it's $60. All right, and then finally, our 10th game on the list is Riders Republic. This is an open world extreme sports game. It takes place in a huge seamless open world that is set in these iconic national parks that are all mashed together for this seamless exploration. You'll be coming across other players in the world and you can team up with them to compete in these wide range of modes like downhill racing, team versus team competition, or large scale competitive races. Key features include this huge social play space from these snowy mountains to arid canyons. You can ride through numerous well-known locations. All of these faithfully transposed and mashed up together to create and allow for seamless exploration between these locations. Really cool, actually. There's also going to be a, a vibrant social hub, they say, that you can gather in and meet other players. Cooperative and competitive modes. There's competitive racetrack and trick challenges available in PvP, co-op, and solo. Uh, mass starts, where they say up to 50 plus players can race with no limits. Community jams, also a large-scale event. Multiplayer arenas with like 6 vs. 16 PvP matchups. There's also going to be online cups uh, with uh, leaderboards. There's going to be customization in this game where you can create your rider and you can also specialize with this progression-based gear system. They also say that apparently the game is going to run on next-gen consoles at 60 FPS while having more than 50 players simultaneously. I know PC Master Race players are going to be like, haha, 60 FPS, but honestly, with 50 simultaneous players on the screen, I do think that's pretty impressive. Uh, Riders Republic is coming to the PC consoles and Stadia on October 28th for $59.99. All right, so those are the 10 most interesting, best looking games, in my opinion. A couple other noteworthy additions that didn't quite make the list. Alan Wake is getting a remaster, apparently. That's pretty cool. I'm actually, I am looking forward to that. Uh, Crisis is getting a remastered trilogy, also like Alan Wake. That's pretty exciting news. And then lastly, Guardians of the Galaxy. I was actually going to put that on this list until I found out that it was a single player only game. So not only do I not really care about Guardians of the Galaxy as like an IP, I also don't really care for single player only games. So it couldn't, it just couldn't make my list, but I'm sure a lot of people are excited for that. People like Guardians, right? People like Guardians. Anyways, that does it for this month's 10 best new PC games to play list. Um, there's a lot on here that I am really looking forward to playing. Now, in the meantime, I'm going to be hopping back into New World to play the game some more. Well, I'm going to be hopping into the queue to wait around some more. It's been a little rough. You'd figure if anyone could have stopped like MMO launch week server login times, it would have been Amazon, but apparently not. They're still having issues anyways. Overall, I'm enjoying the game. I'm going to be playing a bunch more New World, and I'm hoping to do some coverage in the footage if I can gather all my thoughts. Maybe I'll do like a review style video. We'll see. But thank you for watching this video. As always, appreciate your support. Hope you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.